uh, talk on ideas today, uh, which uh, for us as a firm has been uh, very important uh, from the beginning, actually. And uh, a, a kind of thoughts about a lot of different people on this. And uh, of course, then translate that uh, into the work as well. So uh, where does the word idea come from and uh, what does it really mean? You know, I mean, I think we, it's good to kind of go back to the origin of things. And uh, uh, the word idea comes from uh, the Greek idea, which uh, means form or pattern. And the root of that is actually to see. So it's, it's interesting because what it's trying to say is that uh, you see kind of forms or patterns, uh, which maybe say are not so obvious or not so kind of visible. And uh, uh, there are many meanings uh, which uh, exist uh, for uh, the word idea, but uh, one which we particularly find uh, uh, very useful is uh, uh, aim or purpose, you know, and of course, a lot of uh, synonyms which exist, uh, like what's the point of something or what's the goal of something, what is the intention of something, and uh, that's really uh, what ideas uh, could be about. Uh, there are a lot of philosophers who have actually spoken about this through time, uh, uh, who continue to kind of do research on uh, what idea means and it's kind of many manifestations. Uh, and uh, two kind of uh, people who really stand out is uh, Plato and uh, Immanuel Kant, for example. And uh, both of them talk uh, about this as being uh, transcendental. And that's very interesting because uh, it's like a uh, overview of things it's 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 got a higher purpose it's got a higher aim uh, which we all need to uh, be kind of uh, looking for in some sense so i think uh, it's kind of interesting uh, to look at that uh, the talk for today we must confess is uh, the title of the talk is uh, not our own but uh, from this uh, tiny little book actually which uh, uh, is something all of you should get your hands on uh, and it's by this uh, fantastic author called uh, Rod Judkins. Uh, he's a teacher and a creative uh, person. Uh, and he also kind of uh, gives a lot of lectures and talks uh, at uh, Central St. Martin, which is a premier design school in the world in London. And uh, it's a very fascinating book. And uh, he's basically talking about uh, how do we kind of future proof ourselves and how do we actually prepare ourselves uh, for the future. So what do we need for the future? So we all need to be prepared for a world that is fluid, global and interdisciplinary. Distinctions between specialities will blur and overlap. In this vortex, there are no maps. It means there's no direction or we all don't know where to go. It's, it's a confusing time and change used to happen almost two or three generations. It took the West centuries to absorb the effects of Gutenberg's mechanical printing press. But now change is instant and we are seeing kind of the repercussion of this. So this book was written in uh, about three years back. So a lot of things have changed even far more rapidly since that. And we are seeing that change is so uh, instant and rapid in today's day and time. So computers, the internet and other forms of technology reorder the world with alarming frequency. Innovative and creative thinkers are now driving economies. So to prosper in economies of the future, then you need to realize that the real currency of our age is not money. It's not data. It's not attention or time, but it's ideas. And I think this is very important uh, for all of us who wish to survive uh, in kind of uh, the future world, both maybe young students setting out their careers, teachers teaching these kind of young students and of course, practitioners. So we're surrounded by ideas all around us, films, books, music, buildings, fashion, businesses of every scale and size, everything in your culture began life as a vision in someone's head. Ideas can trigger revolutions or nudge society in a particular direction. And they can spring from the unlikeliest people in bedrooms, garages, offices, classrooms of cafes. We've all heard the stories of, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs, you know, starting off in their kind of uh, garages or bedrooms and things like that. So uh, as against say uh, the past where in the industrial era, you learnt a skill and you were set up for life. But in a post-industrial era, a skill becomes redundant even as it's being learnt. 
so a lot of you will realize especially students who probably learned a, a skill which in your first year that by the fifth year that software is probably redundant or a lot of us who are older have probably gone through so many iterations of different uh, skills which are now kind of uh, obsolete in some sense so you no longer need to be just skilled brilliant or talented to be at the heart of things to guide not just your own life but also the future of the world around you so it's not only for ourselves but for everybody around us that we need to make sure that we are able to go beyond mere skill learning so we need to be ideas people essentially we need to be adaptable open minded adept at problem solving a communicator an inventor an artist and an entertainer all kind of rolled in one it's almost like a renaissance person like you know say da vinci was in some sense an ideas person is never content they always want to push in a new direction they create new opportunities by asking intelligent provocative and innovative questions they are re restlessly ambitious about creating better cities buildings clothes cars planes and worlds for everyone so i think this is like very important this sense of curiosity always asking questions is an important trait that we must all develop how do you find your way and do something worthwhile flooded with information from posters advertising social media these days television most people tune out and become passive consumers we'll read a blog shop in a supermarket watch tv buy clothes see a film and download music like sponges they unquestioningly absorb ideas fed to them by schools parents and friends they are a sieve and culture just washes through them but ideas people cup their hands they collect the culture and knead it into something worthwhile they imagine the future for themselves and others so it's important to not just become a passive consumer to actually look at what's important everything that's passing through our hands our minds it's important to reflect on that hang on to things which we think are important and mix that into something that becomes far more meaningful so who are creative people uh he uses a contradictory phase called the intelligent optimist which is used frequently for creatives the intelligent are realists they see things for what they are they try not to let emotion cloud their judgment on the other hand optimists are delusional they leap around like spring lambs exploring for the sake of exploring with playful eagerness they try to make the impossible possible in a world of seemingly intractable social problems i mean look at the times we are in right i mean and of course we are seeing lots of other things like climate change uh, social equity uh, which is kind of a problem so so many problems in the world how can someone who's clever be optimistic so the creative are a mixture of intelligence and optimism they believe they can create better futures but back it up with intellectual rigor with a mixture of humor realism and imagination they look for ways to improve our culture instead of mindlessly consuming they mindfully create so i think the idea of uh, creating something being creators but being also mindful uh, Uh, and reflective in some sense is a very kind of important trait for all of us uh, as creators so now going into uh, a little bit maybe closer to architecture uh, we also find uh, another person uh, who's kind of uh, spoken about this uh, steven hall talks about this but uh, he has an interesting twist to this where he says uh, it's not ideas alone but ideas and phenomena basically looking at uh, experience uh, as being another important kind of determinant in the way we imagine things uh, as being uh, important to the creation of architecture so he talks about uh, an idea is a starting concept for every project which responds to the essential quality and unique architectural possibilities of a given site architecture is born when actual phenomena and the idea that drives it intersects so i think this is very important it's basically uh, you need an idea is kind of abstract and universal whereas you need to situate that idea you need to park it on a site in some sense and that that intersection of when an actual abstract idea finds a place uh, is 
is where kind of architecture happens so that's where meaningful kind of design begins to show itself you know so and i mean whether a rationally explicit statement or a subjective demonstration a concept establishes an order a field of inquiry and a limiting principle the concept acts as a hidden thread connecting disparate parts with exact intention meaning show through at this intersection of concept and experience so this is very important i think all of us do something so it's meaningful so the ability to create meaning through our work is an important kind of aspect that all designers must keep in place and over time we uh, of course uh, you know developed or kind of uh, discovered i would say uh, through the, our journey over time our own way of kind of doing things so our strategy is to study the various desire lines on a site through negotiating the conflicting requirements of site climate technologies clients authorities end users and consultants an idea is evolved that incorporates all these forces this concept is then used to develop the design at all levels and scales creating a unique architectural language for each project we believe that every project is unique and that the design should evolve from the particular characteristics of each project we believe that it is a responsibility of the architect to create diverse innovative and exciting environments each project should add a humane and desirable environment to the world resulting in a continuous improvement of the constructed environment architectural styles are avoided as they limit the options available and stifle exploration and creativity however precedents from all times and cultures are studied to gain experience and knowledge from the past we believe that good design is produced from this careful study and research combined with technical knowledge and artistic judgment random and unforeseen events are examined for the possibility of adding richness and new possibilities to the design attention to detail proportions and scale together with common sense which i we all we think it's like fundamental ensure that the end result fully develops the potential within the concept so we are going to take you very quickly through kind of a scale of projects from uh, like a room and interior of house uh, a kind of smaller housing project uh, a conservation project and if we have some time uh, a public and a civic project as well so we kind of going to go through these uh, quickly so you begin to see how uh, ideas uh, begin to kind of drive what uh, we are shaping i'm going to hand this over to uh, shilpa now hi everyone um so we in the office pinkish me and the rest of the team at s plus ps uh, are for always trying to figure out ways in which we can push the idea of uh, uh, the the question of ideas ahead and uh, hopefully you should see some of it through the projects that we are bound to we are about to show you uh, this first one is a tiny really tiny project called um, playbox uh, we were given an opportunity by a friend of ours Uh, Shilpa, can you come closer to the mic? Okay. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, much better. Thank you. Okay. So we were given an opportunity by a friend of ours, uh, where uh, he had a daughter of nine, uh, who didn't have a special room of her own, but she was only growing older and wanted a special space. Uh, luckily for us, they had a double vaulted roof in the center of the living room, uh, with a kitchen, as you can see. Um, Uh, are coming up to about uh, seven feet, and there was about fourteen feet height in the center, and uh, that was the only place in the entire house where we could plug in a tiny uh, space. Uh, but since it was for a little child, uh, we decided that it should be something interactive, playful, light in construction that could be made off off site and then put into place. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, it is completely from the perspective of a child. How would she interact at different levels depending on which window she opens with the rest of the house and her choice of what she wants to see it was made simply with wooden rafters and uh, bison boards and uh, polycarbonate all lightweight materials made off site uh, in uh, uh, over time and then put on site within 2 days but the idea of play fun Uh, almost like a little uh, house up there somewhere 
and with a little tiny staircase tucked into the side which allowed access to the space. Even from inside you can see how this is more than sufficient for a child with their own cupboards, desk and a bed space. And of course they get the joy of a double vaulted roof also. Uh, the second project becomes a little larger. Um, it's in the context of uh, this, which is Mumbai. And most of us are living upper and in, in, in upper and upper floors now as uh, Mumbai tries to reach the skies. And one just wonders what happens when you start losing in touch with the ground and the nature itself. So it is an attempt here to bring nature back into the apartment uh, and to allow uh, as far as possible natural breezes and light to take over the apartment. Uh, this was the kind of plan offered to us and uh, on the right hand side, the two red boxes that you said, uh, it was meant for a family of three. Uh, so the occupants weren't much. And we decided that we could let go of these two red boxes, uh, cut open the slabs over there to allow for double volumes. So in the actuality, Sorry. In actuality, this was the plan that is there on the ground floor. Right. However, on the ninth floor, however, this is the occupiable space, uh, which is enclosed and the rest of it became open kind of double height verandas uh, filled with greens. Uh, the red doors, which you see over here, then start opening out to allow this uh, space in the middle to almost feel like a pavilion uh, within uh, the greens and allowing the light and breezes to go through them. The surrounding was used for putting the greens in. And then what we did is we put a wrapper uh, along this entire larger volume to show that how the double volume takes uh, is one. And then within it, this pavilion floats in the center. This larger volume was actually wrapped in wood and then it started peeling away and making uh, space and allowing for other uh, things to interact with it, like a door opening or a bar or whatever may be the need for it to do. These were then uh, made in wooden, these were then made in wooden battens and uh, each of these so that the wrapper kind of started showing itself so that the wrapper kind of started showing itself in its volume. And uh, the entire wood was not just uh, singular vineyard, but it was actually solid wood pieces, which were either made concave, worked upon, made conve concave or convex. So that there's a sense of tactility that was brought into the project. Uh, even either when you either visually see it or actually use it on the surface on your floor. Quickly, I shall take you through the project. This is how you would enter with a sense of the wooden uh, wrapper just showing itself to you. And then here inside the living room space where uh, all the windows have now been opened up so as to allow interaction between the outdoor and the indoors. There's a, there's a kind of blurring of boundaries as to where what is inside and what is outside. And uh, just bring attention to the ceiling also over here which was a cast in situ uh, slab uh, where the formwork was actually made so as to allow the uh, kind of pixelation to happen. This shows the occupiables of uh, space below the pavilion, below the floating pavilion. And as you can see the staircase over here, which was a cantilevered stair in steel. This shows the intermediary space between the inside and the outside with the kind of uh, greens which were infused into the space and uh, some hanging from the top, some actually at the bottom. The other double height volumes and it shows how the wooden wrapper kind of goes all the way double height uh, to, to once more uh, assure, ensure that you get the sense of the double volume. And that leads into the outdoor space. Here one can see how one interacts with the neighbors. Uh, so that is green seen at this level and lots of good light and ventilation. Another view of the same from the other side. 
and then of course the balconies and the verandas actually are occupiable space large enough to uh, spend time in here's the staircase that i was talking about which is a uh, cantilevered made of steel with a reducing gradually reducing section towards the mid landing details are the same there was a pitchway that was made which was uh, kind of made on site and put up over there so here's the upper floor where again the rapper continues uh, itself uh, to for the double height volume to signify that the double height volume is on the right hand side and then and then the bedroom on top which again reflects that ceiling which you saw below the flooring is also made in a sense that again recalls the value of that pixelated ceiling below the spaces that are extendable spaces are at the upper level where platforms could become jacuzzis and then the rest of the house was tried to kept open where the bedrooms and the master bedrooms and the guest bedrooms were there uh, where uh, it was all looked as one large space and then the, uh, the and then the closed spaces that is the toilets and the wardrobes were all brought together so that the rest of the space just flows seamlessly visually and uh, pass partially and can be closed at will as and how each one wants them to be this is the family room upstairs notice the door on the right which will shift back and allow that space to become larger and more interactive the son's room which allows for the bed to actually swivel in the center so that different interactions can be made as per choice with the rest of the house and the doors behind opening or closing okay the next one is a little larger it becomes a, a house now this is in uh, belapur and uh, the idea or the question that started rising in our minds were more about uh, how mumbai produce is one of the largest producers of waste in the country and the relationship that we always have with waste uh, has always been a very uh, like we don't want to deal with it and that it's dirty and not pleasurable uh, but can architecture change this negative perception of waste uh, in fact it should be at a level where we think that uh, one should start inserting waste into the cycle of cultural production too so that it almost becomes second nature and not the special thing that we're doing to attempt including uh, waste or reusing materials collage house aims for a transformation of the ambivalent relationship that the society has with waste the site we were given were, was a, uh, on the top of a spur uh, at parsik hill and uh, we of course thought wow beautiful right on top of the hill and we shall have these great views but the site that we were offered was between these two buildings that were already coming up and the uh, house was there was already foundation being laid for across the site uh, our space was in the mid between these two and uh, we soon realized that uh, we will have to uh, give them a space of their own within uh, when other buildings come out too close outside and so the sense of a wrapper was created these are very very initial models where there was a wrapper created which surrounded a courtyard and became the actual structure to allow for other things to enter in extremely initial models the sense of it remains even in the final one this shows the different parts uh, that the wrapper then enclosed and uh, how some of the material started uh, getting used up within this wrapper these were just all initial thinking uh, processes here's a quick video of
So this is how it stands as of today. Uh, th these are the windows that you can see from how one of the inserts was uh, a whole collage of windows that was inserted into it. And uh, there were, we had gone to a place where we had to, we collected about 54 of, uh, in a place called Dotaki in Mumbai, from where we sourced these 54 windows, documented, draw, drew it, uh, repaired them, got glass from it, a lot of glass was missing, went to Dharavi to collect the glass. Uh, the hardware was, uh, some of the hardware had been spoiled, uh, refound uh, the pharma for one of the older hardwares and then recast those hardwares and then put it all into place. The windows actually are uh, hung from the ceiling and the structure lies behind it, which you can see in this detail over here. And hence we could afford to have polycarbonate, which is light. So all the new and the old exist together, the olden more than 100 year old windows and the newer polycarbonate, newer materials all coexist together, the acrylic balconies. Yeah. And uh, here we have uh, the entrance, which was made again through uh, the stone that was quarried from the site itself. The glass circular drum that you see is actually the puja inside, made with thin three inch glasses put together. Uh, even the elevator inside uh, was uh, as a reference to the lovely uh, open elevators that we see in Mumbai in Fort, uh, industrial in nature, and hence the use of the industrial simple pens uh, material, but intertwined to make this beautiful artwork, uh, which, is, which is part of the Vrindavan garden, uh, which the family is followers of Krishna, and so we thought, why not do this? But it's a beautifully crafted screen, which then goes, and the idea, of course, has been taken from the Sanji drawings, cutwork drawings, and then put together by these guys in Bangalore. The staircase, which goes up also, can, is, can, uh, goes from one floor to the other and does not touch the sides. Uh, I would also like to bring atten your attention to the pipes on the left, of which I shall talk a little bit later. This is a living room from inside, it's 14 feet in height, exposed concrete raw ceiling. The windows, what you saw from inside, outside are the same inside and uh, each one of them is openable. Looking towards the dining from that same space and you can see how the uh, windows on the right coexist with uh, typical aluminum frame windows on the left. And uh, here uh, in the front, you can see how uh, we have the, uh, the waste used from the stone quarry, where the, the tile and stone quarry, where the remains of uh, the material after it has been cut into square tiles, the remainder was used for this column cladding. And the ceiling, which is also faceted to not give a typical uh, of beams uh, experience, but instead it's a rib slab, but which was kind of faceted. This is the courtyard that is shared by the entire house and one of the best spaces because it helps in interacting, bringing the entire house, which belong from a two year old to a 92 year old, all of them together. Uh, and we're actually sitting on top of a, a water conservation tank over here of 50,000 liters. And the bench that you can see on the left over here, the wooden bench is actually uh, four manhole covers which uh, allow access into the filtration tanks below. The pipes that you can see in the front are, no, are MS pipes, not only, uh, some are cladding, uh, not cladding, sorry, some are used as fillers, some are structural, and some are actually pipes that bring water from the roof down into the conservation tank. There was an entire water diagram that was created to understand how water would flow uh, and enter the tank. Here are views of showing uh, the little water body that we have on the left, the use of metal, which was also sourced from uh, some scrap yards. A fun bathroom that we had made of uh, lots of leftover mirrors. And the idea continues not only in the exterior, but continues our inside into the interiors too where one uses leftover picture frames as a, as a uh, bed backboard. 
and on the left you can see the bamboo being used as the screen the bamboo that was used on site during construction actually the metal that you saw from outside continues to be uh, come inside and become the study table and then that sense of interaction that you would have from this master bedroom to the living bedroom to the upper bedrooms so there is though the house is large uh, one is always interacting with uh, the rest of the people in the house this is one of the upper rooms i should go a little faster here the wood was all resourced from uh, dotaki uh, and uh, here we have uh, uh, printing blocks put together to form another space uh, which actually conceal a cupboard behind them in this section there are two things in the left section you can see the how the water tanks uh, the courtyard sits on the water tank below uh, how the living room gets a larger height and then that little pavilion on the left side which was added later uh, uh, to add a different kind of space experience on top in the right hand section uh, bringing your attention to that little uh, water tank on top this was never meant to be like this it was meant to be just flat over there but one of the visits on the site uh, showed us a beautiful light that was coming streaming in from the top and this was a last minute decision actually uh, uh, pushing us by our uh, engineer who said that this quality of light must be uh, let's kind of use it and which would then stream all the way down through the staircase uh, to the ground floor so the last minute we kind of used uh, tarpaulin sheets uh, with re rebars and uh, kind of almost like push the a uh, water tank slightly ajar from the main uh, wall to allow the light to come in details lots of details that were of course used I'm not talking much about this this is the view from back in the pavilion on top which was made to be light and a little, diff little different experience than the ones below even the pavilion the way it stands is actually held structurally by these columns that were sourced to the 100 year old columns that were sourced from cochin and then they hold up a steel so it's always this new and old which comes together seamlessly so that's for the collage house and uh, we shall continue with uh, a little larger project which is the housing yeah so uh, this is a project we did in uh, lonavla a while back uh, and i'm going to go to quickly jump into it uh, so housing if you look at housing the state of housing today uh, it kind of uh, oscillates between these two extremes uh, one is this cookie cutter kind of mass produced uh, developer model uh, which has this sense of sameness in it and on the left uh, you see uh, informal settlements which out of no choice are kind of uh, hugely uh, individualized and kind of handmade from whatever material uh, they find so there's this kind of huge kind of diversity between the two models of housing that exist today uh, we were looking at what are the kind of other ways uh, which people have discovered how society has discovered uh, to kind of individualize things so this is like what they would call an ikea hack you take kind of a mass produced item and you actually kind of customize it to suit your taste in some sense uh today everything from your denims to your car can actually be made as per your specification so this is idea of mass customization uh, even uh for things that are kind of so called factory produced uh also product designers for example two examples in this case uh looking at uh, kind of mass production uh systems with somehow uh, instead of being kind of identical and perfect begin to leave their mark of production on uh, the products that they're producing whether the vase or the kind of stool in this case so there's a sense of individualization even in kind of mass produced items or what one finds very kind of uh, rapidly in these days a uh, crowd sourcing this is like a typeface that was sourced from lots of users across the world Uh, and of course the idea of open source which allows uh, people to kind of tinker and kind of fiddle around and uh, you know uh, create their own uh, kind of code or whatever it is but by kind of open source systems that allow people to participate essentially and uh, one finds that architects are normally always behind in these kind of societal kind of changes that are happening and how can architects actually do something can we actually do something about this and that's the kind of challenge uh, we had kind of laid on ourselves 
so the project was meant to be uh, housing like i mentioned and we started with the smallest unit and kind of a simple uh, unit which is like a 3.5 meter unit by 10 meters long and kind of with 3 meters height and uh, what we said is that uh, instead of that 3 meters what if we just raise it to kind of 4.5 and what that allows you essentially is a small kind of loft within and that obviously came from uh, two things one is the existing buildings on the site so the top left uh, image you see is the existing uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, colonial uh, buildings on site which had this huge height obviously a great climatic device to deal with the uh, heat and the humidity which is there but also looking at uh, smaller informal settlements where uh the way to increase space is to add a loft within and in, in completely kind of uh, adds value to what is essentially small square footage so you're moving from square footage to cubic footage in some sense and we said it's important to extend these units even at the smallest scale to a small piece which you can call your own i mean extend into nature and look at the times we are in currently and how that's proving to be so important for all of us to have this little kind of patch of nature in some sense so the idea was that everybody should have this little patch of green and through that kind of essentially two simple kind of devices we de we designed a series of uh, five different sizes and types of uh, homes uh, which go from the 40 square meter which is a 1 and a half bhk to a, a 5 bhk which is like 195 square meters Uh, and within each of this, for example, in uh, the top left in unit A, you can see that there are actually four different uh, variations uh, within uh, that same square uh, feet size of a room, which means you can have choose to have a kitchen right in the middle of your house or at the side of the house. So based on what kind of a person you are, you can actually choose what kind you are. Similarly, in uh, the sixty square meter unit, which is a kind of a 2 and a half bhk similarly you get variety and options to choose from what kind of unit you want to live but all these units were dictated by kind of this strict module of a 3.5 meter uh, grid which actually brings a kind of uh, constant scale to the project so even something like the shop or the office or the banquet hall is kind of dictated by this uh, modularity and of course that came from the earlier idea of uh, in some sense prefabricating this off site that of course never happened but that's what was driving it but we said is that enough i mean can we actually begin to do far more than this and we said what if people could choose uh, what kind of windows they want from this kind of uh, you know palette of different types different colors what if they could choose considering they have such great uh, height of uh, 4.5 meters could they choose the kind of screens that happened in front of their homes or the kind of uh, terraces they had and the kind of way that the terrace was enclosed or the kind of railings they had so you have these uh, kind of options of like five different kinds of railings which go from wood metal concrete the kind of variety of openness changes or the kind of types of gardens that they could begin to choose from a fully paved for a fully green to kind of combinations thereof or the kind of staircases you had to go up to the loft or the kind of flooring tile that you could choose and so on and so forth so what emerges is this kind of uh, a matrix of options where you could begin to choose what size house i want to live in within that what kind of layout do i want what kind of a window do i want what kind of a screen i want and so on and so forth till you are actually able to kind of customize in some sense a kind of home which you could call your own which becomes like my unit in some sense and it allows people who are normally not part of this process to participate in the kind of homes that they're making and let's i mean and increases the individuality of the units i mean we should also understand this is done within kind of a developer model so it's quite a kind of challenge so this is what we had actually told him at the beginning of the project that what if we could actually devise an app which allows you to uh, see what kind of home you are actually producing and that that uh, you know users could actually play around with this till they could figure out what could actually uh, be what they would like this of course never happened it remained at the level of ideas like a lot of things that architects do uh, but i thought it is an interact interactive tool uh, which at uh, through technology which allows people to actually again participate so i'm going to run through this a little quickly this is a site uh, it's actually adjoining the railway tracks uh and at the railway crossing itself 
and uh, the line you see on the top uh, is the kind of uh, mumbai pune expressway which kind of uh, runs a little bit away from the site uh, like i mentioned uh, right at very green the whole thing right at the railway you can actually see the train whizzing past on the top image and the middle the the end of the site uh, around if you see the lowest photograph had these old buildings uh, which we really kind of try i would save but uh, we're not able to manage all of that but i'll kind of get to that in a second but that, that whole central portion is raised a little bit higher than the rest of the site so we start from what i just explained is this simple kind of uh, unit this tube which is there the tube grows and kind of arm uh, which contains mostly the services uh two of them kind of interlock to form a service courtyard it arrays itself in a linear portion we open up gaps to allow for vision access breezes through this entire thing we shift them around uh, essentially to respond to uh, outdoor conditions so it's the shape of the plot it's the location of a tree that comes in the way which allows us to move these a little bit back and forth we we kind of stack the same unit on the higher level again and we push and pull these uh, again at the upper level such that everybody like we explained earlier eventually gets a patch of green so all the upper units have terraces which are facing the street and everybody on the lower floor gets a rear facing uh, garden at the ground the gaps in between are then linked with these smaller bridge units which actually allow for an additional bedroom to be kind of added to the unit which takes a one and a half bhk to become a two and a half bhk and of course we have this series of walk ups that kind of take you up so at the level of the site uh, there's basically that's kind of the road uh, the railway and the existing trees which were there we start with the commercial kind of building which works like a darwaza like a gateway to the entire kind of community there's a little setback we've left from the tracks which the developer thought would help uh kind of sell the flats rather the sell the units from being kind of too close uh which we didn't think was a problem but anyway you you enter into this through the darwaza building into this kind of linear arrangement of the street which gets created which we just showed you how it's formed uh these are the three kind of units which we managed to salvage from the existing uh, buildings uh which were then uh, extended and added to become a kind of small community center uh it creates a large central green area uh, in the middle again surrounded by more units of course of different sizes this time and two other uh, large villas which kind of bring you through into this uh, thing so you see here the configuration of varied sizes each of the colors represents kind of a different unit size which are all mixed together on the site and this distribution of private and public open space so all the yellow is like largely contiguous uh, open spaces which are public whereas the greens are the private spaces that uh, individuals enjoy and of course the kind of uh, uh, vehicular and pedestrian circulation which uh, connects all these different parts of the site together so that's essentially kind of what emerges across the site uh, in this overall thing and you'll see in the scrolling kind of section at the bottom that the rear portion the the part on the right is actually like a meter and a half above the rest of the street which is actually that large green courtyard that you see in the plan as well <clears throat> so running quickly running you through the the kind of images this is the kind of darwaza building uh, which is there uh, this is on the left is uh, of course the kind of banquet halls and uh, kind of a community gathering space for people the right side uh so this is the kind of open uh kind of uh, uh circulation that leads you uh, to that it's a, it's a kind of slightly more celebratory space for events a uh, smaller snippets of uh, those areas uh this is the hall itself from within and this is the kind of uh, offices which uh, happen at the first floor these are the actual units how they kind of uh, turned out so you can see that there's a variety of uh, kind of uh, railings uh, windows screens uh, there's like five different colors that we've used on these units as well uh, this is the actual street in the center 
you can see that uh, connecting uh, pergola in the middle uh, which uh, kind of breaks the scale of that linear street and on the right you can see uh, yeah, the bridge units which actually connect only on the top and have actually nothing uh, below these are small little porches uh, which every unit enjoys to kind of uh, kind of uh, enter from and of course you start seeing that the kind of uh, variety of terrace configurations and the walk up stairs that is all interwoven with these kind of existing trees which are there again uh, here a lot of uh, details and the idea essentially is that at some point kind of nature begins to take over and kind of you know uh, break through uh, these kind of uh, buildings and it kind of merges back into nature so that's the kind of uh, configuration of the the street itself and at the end of that street uh, it's kind of terminated with this double height uh, uh, pergola again which kind of it terminates that experience of that entire street these are the insides of the units uh, the top left is uh, the actual loft we made sure that they had uh, if not one at least maybe two windows for cross ventilation where they could actually uh, use that space it's, it's been very interesting to see how people have adapted these units to become hobby rooms children's rooms for a visiting uh, parent maybe people around home offices so it's really interesting how people have used these kind of uh, loft spaces and you'll see one kind of staircase configuration in the right hand side photograph and here you see the other two staircases a linear one and a spiral one uh, again with the spiral the kitchen is kind of an open kitchen right in the center the idea always being that people are not the same and they want to live differently and how can we actually uh, enable that as uh, designers that they have choice uh, in the way they choose to live and of course the open kind of terraces and gardens that happen these are the the villas uh, which uh, are kind of the larger villas which are there and this is the large kind of central uh, green area uh, and towards the back you can see these three kind of uh, units which are there which is actually uh, what we uh, tried and eventually salvaged from the existing uh, kind of buildings that were there so uh,